here are our slides. Just remember, this is live medicine rounds on Zoom. So unfortunately, for those of you who are on Zoom, you'll be muted by default. Please use the QA function. Uh, I am not afraid of questions, uh, as the residents found out this morning. I am very happy and open to answer them. Um, disclosures. So I am really boring. Like, I don't have any disclosures. I feel like I'm a chair and I should have like, all these relationships with like fancy entities. I don't. Um, so very, very boring. We'll talk about these things. So what I tell my medical students when I teach is I don't read objectives, but y'all can. So objectives, because that's just waste time. And the overview. So we're going to talk about a lot of interesting topics today. And I'm going to end this with some things about my own life. And what I, what I would ask of all of you is to, once you hear some of these things, don't feel too bad for me because I'm standing here today as a professor in joint chair pathology. So it didn't turn out too badly. So don't feel bad for me. But they are interesting stories that will, I think, help you reflect on how you know, we should all be interacting with each other because some of the things that I'll tell you won't be that different for people who are just a little different. So talking about diversity in the United States, and it's important to understand who we are as a nation so that we can then look at diversifying what I think is probably the most incredible specialty in medicine. We are fortunate in that however we are tied to pathology, whether it be through clinical medicine, whether it be through research, we're pretty darn incredible. And I don't think there's a smarter group of physicians and scientists anywhere in medicine than what we have here in pathology. In 2010, you, so what we have, whenever, every 10 years when the census is done, they look at a diversity index. The diversity index essentially will tell you how diverse your state is. So surprise, surprise, even though Hawaii is one of the smallest states in the union, it is actually the most diverse um, because you can find pretty much someone of every type in Hawaii. I mean, they are very ethnically diverse. And if you've ever been to Hawaii, you know, Hon Honolulu in particular, you'll see it. You'll see it on the streets every single day. I, I am from New Jersey. Um, I, I do not speak like a New Jersey person per se. I don't do Jersey Shore. But um, I can tell you that one of the things I love about New Jersey and why I choose to stay is because it's so diverse. And that's really what I want to try to raise my children. It is a, a world where there are people that look like them, but a whole bunch of people who don't. And that I'm very grateful for. Also, food's kind of awesome. The more diverse your settings are, the better the food is. And that is the truth. Um, I should stop talking about food because jokes could be made. So when we look at 2020, so we started 2010, you'll notice there was a lot less dark green. By 2020, there's a lot more dark green because the states were beginning to become more diverse. So Hawaii, California, my good old home state of New Jersey, all becoming more diverse. And it's, and it's a good thing. We, we do better the more mixed we are and this is not a bad thing because you need it's not just diversity of how people look it's diversity of ideas it's diversity of thought and people bring so much to the table you know what i want to try to convey is diversity even though this first part is largely about race diversity is not just about race and we'll we'll, we'll kind of get through that as we work through this talk so again, New Jersey, woohoo, top 10 in diversity index. And you really, I mean, you do see it. If you, there are areas of New Jersey where you will be, you'll actually be strained to find people that are very fair, where there are other parts of New Jersey where folks are all very fair. But there are areas, and this is what working at Rutgers has become so fun. Rutgers is very diverse. And it's one of the things I like about the school. We attract students, not from just all over New Jersey, which helps, but from all over the country. And we do have a good number of underrepresented students. We have a pretty solid number of underserved students, you know, kids who grew up economically disadvantaged, who now have the opportunity to get what I think is a pretty phenomenal education at our state university. So yes, in some parts of the country, we're doing a little bit better, but I think there's work to be done. This is an interesting map. This also comes from the census, and they look at every state by county. And so what you'll notice, even though we talk about diversity, is most of the United States is still a white dominant area. Even though areas are diverse, most areas still have predominantly white people. And when you're in middle America, you see predominantly white people, but that's where you also see larger areas of indigenous Americans because that's where a lot of tribal land still exists. And we'll talk a little bit about tribal medicine as we get through because something really cool happened last week that I picked up just as I was preparing this lecture. So not to anyone's surprise here, um, 
white Americans and they're white alone, not Hispanic, still account for the largest uh, population in the United States. This has decreased a little bit since 2010, but it, that is still what we see. Hispanic populations are the second largest group at almost 19 percent, and then African American or black groups. And this is interesting, too, within the black community. What should you call a black person? Should you call them black or should you call them African American? And there are some people who have very strong opinions on this, and some of it's now creeping into the literature. Very interesting that there are some African Americans who prefer to be called African American because it doesn't negate their experience dealing with chattel slavery in the United States. So not everybody who is a black person has the same lived experience, whether it be their ancestors or the people that they are today. And so this is something that's kind of creeping out in the literature now that, um, that you may want to be aware of. Some people are lumpers and some people are splitters. Um, you know, the other thing, it's like pathology. Everything's like, <coughs> excuse me, you can make a pathology reference about almost everything in this talk, by the way. Um, and not just because we're talking about pathology. So what do we look like as pathologists? What do we look like as physicians? Because I'm a big believer, I'm gonna say this again later, that you can't be what you don't see. And students get very inspired if there's somebody like them. And like them, again, doesn't have to be race or ethnicity. If you have a trans student and they meet their first trans professor, they're gonna be pretty darn happy about that because there aren't many yet. You know, if you meet somebody who's non-binary and the student's non-binary, they're gonna be fairly attached because you're not ha you don't have many examples of these kinds of folks, definitely not in academic medicine and certainly not in leadership. We're just not there yet. And so there are opportunities to get students, I think, really jazzed, not just about medicine, but about pathology, which is one of my goals in life, because I really want to see more people get into, um, get into pathology. So this is who we are as doctors today. This is how it breaks down. And there's a lot of emphasis. This is all from the double AMC. There is, <coughs> excuse me, there is a lot of emphasis on race and ethnicity. I think we need to kind of back off a little bit on that only because there are so many other things that make a human a human. And it's all the parts of the human that are important to that person. But we do, we do tend to stick to race and ethnicity. So white Americans or, or white people, I should say, because not every physician in the United States is American. White physicians are still the, the largest subgroup in the United States, followed by Asians, then Hispanic docs, and then black and African American. And it really drops off after that. You know, Native American physicians are very, very rare, unfortunately. Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, super rare in the United States. Now we're talking less than 1%. So we don't have a lot of representation, although that's going to soon change. And what I think is really cool, and I stumbled onto this yesterday, there is now an osteopathic school in Oklahoma. It is a tribal school. It's the Oklahoma State College of Osteopathic Medicine, the Cherokee Nation. And the Cherokee Nation actually helped fund a building for these students to build a school where they could have their preclinical years. And then they do a lot of rural medicine rotations, but also um, rotate in some of the larger hospitals in, in Oklahoma to get their training. And the goal is, one, to have more indigenous students. So in their class of 46 students, 20 of them were indigenous American, which is probably one of the largest indigenous classes to ever graduate in the United States. They graduated another 15 indigenous students at the University of Oklahoma. So that's at least 35 indigenous doc now doctors who have come out of the state of Oklahoma just this year. And it's been a really valiant effort. And people were excited to go, because a lot of these students want to go back into their tribes, and a lot of them are tribe affiliated. So they want to go back to their tribes and be the physicians for those people, but also to help kids see that, yes, you can be Native and be a physician. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. So this was an incredible effort. And these, these students are now, they're not students. They are now doctors. And I was actually really surprised that yesterday was the first time I've ever heard of this. Like the fact that there was another whole medical school that none of us seem to have heard of. And I'm like, it was in stat news. I'm like, we should be talking about this in like the New York Times. Like, why are we talking about this in stat news? So there are opportunities to promote this throughout the United States. And they actually had, like, they had a beautiful ceremony where everybody transitioned through to becoming physicians. It was just a really heartwarming read, if you, if you get the time. It was great. So these next, I guess, four or five slides are all going to look alike, and they speak to one point. The younger your physician is, the more likely she is to be a woman. What we are seeing over time, so the bottom 
this is the 65 and older crowd. There are very few in pretty much every ethnic group of women physicians over the age of 65. You get below 35, however, and you see what's happened here. The number of women physicians has jumped way up. And this is reflecting what we're seeing in medical school. Women have now taken a slight edge over men in medical school admissions. So now it's something like 57% to 43% for those who identify male to female, and I, or female to male, I should say. And I'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit in a minute, because what we're finally starting to do now in medical school admissions is to talk about everybody else. The initial assumption of surveying is that everybody's cisgender. Well, are you male or female? And that was it, and there was no other answer. Now we're starting to look at, are you male? Are you female? Are you transgender male? Are you transgender female? Are you non-binary? We'll get into that in a second, because that's a, a whole category of people. And these are important questions to ask, because guess what? I'm sure one of you in this room knows a non-binary physician. You may not know they're non-binary, because really it's none of your business, but you may know one and not even know it. I know a transgender pathologist for fact. And she's very open about the fact that she is transgender. So, and I'm thinking, if she's talking about it, then there's more than one. There is no way in the world there's not more than one. And so we are unique, not just by our ethnicity, but by all the other things that make us human. So the good thing is I can fly through these next several slides, which all show the exact same thing. So this is what we see with Hispanic and Latino physicians. This is what we see with Asian physicians. The same thing with white physicians, although the white group is where women to men is still closest in the very young age group, that 34 and under. That is the only, and it's women by like a hair. It's like 51, 49. So it's a very close um, female majority, but it's there. And the same thing um, with black physicians um, by age and sex, so much so that actually a lot of medical school admissions groups are concerned about the dearth of black men applying to medical school. Because one of the things that I'm sure you've seen all the literature, patients respond very well to doctors who look like them. So who is that, you know, that black teenager going to respond the most, like a black teenage boy going to respond best to? Probably a black male. But we're seeing the numbers of black men dropping in medicine. So that's something that, you know, people are very concerned about and rightfully so. Again, there's a comfort to being treated by someone who looks like you. Now. Here we are, we are the medical school faculty. This is the thing we pride ourselves in being the people who teach the students and teach the residents. We all do the right thing. Um, and it, what patholo medical school faculty pretty much mirror the population with one exception. So white physicians, and by the way, the AAMC hasn't looked at this data since 2019. So I'm thinking we have another diversity facts and figures coming at some point. We're not there yet, but the largest group, again, is that white physician group. Asians, so this 19.2% are Asian physicians. And I think this is kind of unfair because we tend to be lumpers when it comes to folks who are Asian. So you take people who are Chinese and Japanese and Korean and Indian and Pakistani, you lump them all into one category. And it's like, but they're not all the same. So why do we say Asian as this big group? But the same, the reality is we do that with pretty much every ethnic group. And if we really started splitting it, the charts would be impossible to read. So I guess people just do this for ease of data. But I think it's important to acknowledge that not all Asians, are, I mean, not all anybody are the same, but not all Asians are the same because there are so many different ethnicities within that group. Um, his, there are more Hispanic physicians in medical school faculty than there are black physicians. And like the regular physician population, it does drop off when you start looking at indigenous American populations. So it's interesting. So this is the total number of physicians in pathology. And I'm surprised this number is as high as it was in 2022, because y'all were around post COVID when everyone decided to quit. It's been the single longest for all I've done for the last four years is hire people and give this talk. Um, <laughs> Because seriously, like all I do is read CVs and form search committees and interview people. And I am over it because it's just been the, I just I want to go to work one day and, and not have to worry about whether or not there are enough people there. I don't want to have to worry about if someone's going to like, you know, re resign because they got a job, double the salary somewhere else. I'm really waiting for this hallow day to happen. It's not close. I'm sorry. Because we've been there. <laughs> It, we, we could commiserate for hours on the hiring thing. And th there were times where, you know, as a chair, sometimes you just have to step up and be a staff pathologist again. We'll talk about that off the recording. So 
The interesting thing is, I was actually surprised there are so many pathologists in this country. I was actually also surprised that the locum tenens number is 0.1%, because I'm convinced that number is higher now. Uh, and I, you know, I told the residents a story while we were, ha- while we were chatting this afternoon about um, a really great pathologist, great doctor I'm trying to hire, who I met as a locum. And he's, gotten, he's really gotten into the academic mission. Like, we're actually like, working on the offer letter and everything. He's really into the mission. Like, he started writing papers with the residents. He's doing a poster at AANP next month with one of our medical students. I mean, this guy is like, he's really about it. But the reason he's a locum is because when COVID hit, he was in private practice. In New Jersey, there was an executive order which shut down all elective surgery for three months. His practice couldn't afford to pay him. They had to let him go. And this is, this is a reality. When you're in private practice, you, you kind of eat what you kill. Your, your salary, your money comes from what you do as a physician. Academics is awesome. I, I still have a job. So, but that's how I stumbled onto this incredible young man who I'm hoping will now be on my faculty. So I was surprised the locum's numbers are so low. But pathology, the important part of this slide is pathology mirrors what the, phys- what the physician populist mirrors, which is essentially, you know, white physicians are the majority in pathology. We do still have more men than women in pathology, although that's starting to go in the other direction. Um, and then Asians are our second most common group, followed by Hispanic docs, African-American docs, and then indigenous Americans, which again are less than 1%. And I am happy to say that one of those indigenous docs who graduated from Oklahoma State is going into a pathology residency. So yes. Um, even though they try to push them toward rural medicine, but I'm glad we got one. So we are the academic pathologists. We are the teachers. We are the clinical folks. We are doing the researchers. We're doing the research, rather. And we are small, like 6,200. And, and this was 6,200 in 2020, so it's probably like 5,500 now because there really was a mass exodus around the pandemic, and it's been, it's been tough. But um, for now, men do still out, outnumber women in academic pathology. And we mirror the rest of pathology, so I don't need to read through the numbers. But we are, academic pathology is small. And this is one of the things I was pointing out to the residents again this morning. 80% of pathologists are out in the community. They're not sitting here hanging out with us. I mean, they are out in community hospitals. They are doing their thing. They are pushing glass, in some cases, seven days a week, um, or handling their issues in their blood banks, handling their clinical labs. So it's a lot of work out there in the community. We're actually a very small part of what's being done in the pathology landscape. But we're important because we're the ones teaching the students. They see us first, and that's pretty critical. I am really surprised that there are 490 pathologists in New Jersey. I think this is a lie. Like I said, it's impossible to hire. I don't buy it. I I have to watch my mouth on this. Like, I was infuriated when I saw this. I just can't believe. Like, I also can't believe there are more pathologists in New Jersey than there are here in Washington. Like, I'm sorry, 425 here and 490 in New Jersey, I don't buy it. I don't care how populated we are. I don't buy it. If I, we had 490 pathologists, I'd be smiling every single day. I'm not smiling yet because we have, we got a long way to go. You know, one of the fun things about my job is I'm one of the senior vice presidents in our health system for our pathology service line. And this is all we talk about is hiring, hiring pathologists, hiring techs, because it's, and it's not just us. In the lab, it's everywhere. It's where they practice. And in New Jersey, and that's a great question, because in New Jersey, there are a lot of people that go back and forth. Either there's New Jerseys that go to New York or New York that comes to New Jersey. We're seeing a little more New York coming to New Jersey because the cost of living is a little bit better. A lot of the New Jerseys that used to go to New York are coming into New Jersey because really it gets a little old to pay 15 bucks to cross the GWB to get into the city or to spend your life savings on your monthly subway pass. So we're seeing a lot more exodus from New York back into New Jersey. Sorry, NYU, that's partially my fault. Okay, so we, we're all stealing from each other in New York and New Jersey. I'm not gonna try to hide it. We're literally all stealing from each other because there are only so many pathologists. I, I predict, don't get scared, y'all. I predict we have another like five years of training before this actually starts to balance out a little bit. Sorry, Jeff. Um, so there are some flaws to this data. There really, really are, and I really hope this next slide works because I love it. Because why not bring Samuel Allen to your lecture? So there are some flaws. There, okay, there are some flaws. The, they are very heavily gender specific, particularly with double AMC. It took 
years for them to start asking questions other than are you male, male or female? Years. And I think we were not capturing, and it wasn't male, female, prefer not to say other, it was male or female. You know, when I took my matriculation questionnaire, it's a long time ago now, I'm like, wow, y'all just got male or female here. That was like the one question. That was the one question pretty much till 2019. And what people now are finally starting to look at and understand is we are more than just an ethnicity. We are a gender. We have sexuality, or maybe we don't. Because there are people who identify as asexual, who have no interest in anybody, and that's perfectly fine. We have to look at who everyone, who everyone is and embrace them for who they are. So people who are non-binary do not define exclusively as a man or a woman. And one of the most power things I saw, powerful things I saw was on Saturday Night Live, I guess about a year ago, where M Molly Kearney, who is proudly Saturday Night Live's only non-binary uh, cast member, did a really good like monologue essentially on um, on the news segment. Which I actually I love Colin Joseph and Michael Che, and they cracked me up. But she did a really powerful segment on when, when people were deciding whether or not it's fair or right for kids to decide whether or not they're non-binary. And she goes, "If you have an issue with a kid deciding whether or not they're non-binary or whether or not they're transgender, you don't actually care about that kid. You care about your agenda." And it was really powerful coming from somebody who knows exactly who they are. So I, I just thought it was incredible. You know, people who are non-binary are not lumped into one thing. There are several categories. So some people are gender queer. They, they don't acknowledge the static notions of gender. Some people are gender fluid. They kind of switch back and forth as they choose. Uh, some people are agender. They, they feel neutral. They don't, they don't identify as he or she. They feel neutral. And there's a really great site for the Human Rights Campaign. The link is here which goes through a lot of different definitions of how people can identify, you know, whether they're gay or they're lesbian or they're any non-binary non identity or they're transgender. And it's really, really helpful as you need to learn to speak the language. You know, at University Hospital in Newark, we, have, we are a transgender center of excellence. So we actually treat a lot of patients who are transitioning to, from male to female or female to male. We see pap smears or people who are transitioning all the time, all the time. And I'll look right at it, and it'll be like, it'll say, you know, 24-year-old female, and they give the whole history. They don't bother saying the female is transgender, and then you, and not, and they'll tell you, but they'll tell you, not postpartum, all right? And then I look at the slide, and they go, 90 bucks, this person's transgender, and they're taking testosterone, because the entire smear is atrophic. Your average 24-year-old woman is not going to have an atrophic pap smear, not if she's your average 24-year-old woman. But your average 24-year-old transgender woman who might be taking hormones will have an atrophic pap smear. And so I actually ended up talking to somebody. I said, you know, you might want to give us that information so I'm not swinging for an epic every single time I read one of these cases because we get a lot of them now. And these are important. As, as we've talked about, you know, laboratory values in patients who may be transgender, this is something we see every day. It comes across the microscope. And I don't think I've heard anybody really talk about that in pap smears. So it's not just on the clinical lab side. We also see it in AP. We get organs for people who are, who are transitioning all the time. So we'll get testes that are otherwise perfectly normal. And I have more than one person. Well, why are we taking out normal testes? Well, I'll tell you why. So this is something that we face in laboratory medicine and pathology every single day. We see it. And so we have to be cognizant of it. It's really, really important. So yes, we have our matriculating student questionnaire. The cool thing about this, 1.4% of matriculating students identify as something other than the gender they were assigned at birth. 1.4% of medical students is not a small number. And so we have to be sure that we're mindful when people tell you what their preferred per pronouns are, while you may or may not think that's cool, it's really important to that person that you identify with them the way they wish to be seen. That is really, really important. So now they're actually asking the questions. I mean, you, we never had this many different areas that you could choose to be comfortable. And it's important to say that a, a zero doesn't necessarily mean that no one is whatever that category is. It's just not enough to round to 0.1%, that's all. So where you see some of these zeros, there probably are people, it's just not enough to get them up to the, to the 0.1%. And people, are, they're now asking questions about sexual orientation. My humble opinion is it's probably nobody's business unless you want to share it. But it's important 
for people to realize that we're not all cisgendered. We have to, we're not all heterosexual and we need to be mindful that not everybody is the same. So with this little primer and all the things that make us diverse, I have to keep my eye on the time, we still aren't doing that great a job recruiting pathology, pathologists into residencies. And um, there are a lot of reasons for this. Part of it is the stereotypes. Now, I do not think we are socially inept. If I thought we were socially inept, I wouldn't be standing here. I'd also probably be having a really hard time giving this talk, which I'm not. So one of the things that we have to remember is that some of us have social skills. But guess what, guys? But guess what? It gets better. It gets better. There are a whole lot of doctors and other specialties who have no social skills. Zero. Zero. And as my loving husband says to me, almost every day, he's an engineer, and he really is the bomb because he took my son to baseball today. He said, if some of your colleagues worked in the real world, they'd get fired. Because the real world is everything outside of medicine to him. Because occasionally I will tell him a story that I found really disturbing, like something I overheard at work that I find terribly disturbing. And if you're going to say something like in an elevator, then it's not a secret. You chose to be not mindful of your surroundings. And he's just like, we can't say stuff like that at work. Like, we would literally not have jobs. And so what I ask of us, and especially of our faculty as we speak to our trainees, is just to be mindful of what we are saying because you just never know the entire makeup of who somebody is. So we have to be careful. But I think I mean, I think I'm socially fine. I, I, I don't love going out. I'd actually rather sit on my couch and watch sports or go to a live sporting event. But it doesn't mean we're socially inept. So they did a survey, and I, I love a good survey, except for when it makes us look really bad, which this does. Pathologists don't like people. This is what, this is what medical students thought. Now, you wonder why you can't get people to go into pathology? Pathologists don't like people. I have to say, I like people except for the ones that don't like me and the ones that are rude and nasty. I like people very much. I prefer when they speak to me. No offense, Dr. Jackson. I don't prefer the dead. I prefer the living, and that's okay. Spend all day with dead bodies. I spent half my day with Dr. Jackson, lest I checked I was alive. So I don't know. Poor communication skills. These are the people who have never in their lives read a pathology report, because let me tell you, writing a pathology report, sans synoptic, because that took away all of our glory, writing a pathology report is one of the single most beautiful ways to communicate ever, whether it is a report from the clinical lab or a report from anatomic, it is an amazing way to communicate. And oh, by the way, if you call me, I'll talk to you about it. Shh, don't tell anybody. Other comments, morbid fascination with death. Uh, I, uh, this, this is not an M. Night Shyamalan movie. I prefer my people talking. Technicians and not proper doctors. So this is what I do now. I teach on the third day of the first year of medical school. I am the first physician that our medical students meet in the lecture setting. And so what I do is I'll say, hey, I used to sit way up there in 2000. Yes, I am a doctor. Because if they don't understand early that pathologists are physicians, they're not going to get it. They don't realize that, like them, we went to medical school. Although I still have my PhD envy. We can address that later. The sad part of all of this is that most of these comments come from other doctors. It is our colleagues who we are helping every single day that are throwing us under the bus. So I hope you're watching other kinds of colleagues. Be nice to your friendly neighborhood pathologist, both to their face and behind their back if you can help it. Don't tell students. So what I got told, and I'll never forget, I was on a medicine AI, God give me strength, when I was a fourth year student and it was post-match and so I hat and match, we'll get into that part a little bit later. And I ended up going into PATH, thank God for small favors. And when I told the attending that I was going to pathology, he goes, my God, what a waste. And I said, excuse me? Because I see at this point, I was graduating from medical school, and I just didn't care anymore. I didn't care what you can do, fail me. And he goes, you got too much personality for that. This is not the first time I had heard that. I met a guy, a surgeon who was really, really like, Clark Kent and Superman handsome. And if you were born in a certain era, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And this dude said, you've wasted your entire life. Look me dead in the face. You've wasted your entire life. I said, in what way? He goes, you communicate too well to be a pathologist. And I said, you see that door over there? He goes, yeah. I said, you can go. And he just looked at me and I said, look, who's talking to you right now? He goes, you. I said, okay. 
If I communicate with you well, doctor, whose patient I'm taking care of, don't you think that's important? And shouldn't I be here? He went a solid three weeks before he finally came back with his tail between his legs and apologized because he knew he was wrong. We got to stop doing this stuff. We have to stop perpetuating the myth that we are not that we are not social creatures. There are introverts. And and this is really irritating. Intuitive, detail oriented introverts. I'm cool. The intuitive, detail oriented part because we are. Of course, we're detail oriented. Otherwise, people will be misdiagnosed and potentially die. Emphasis on intellectual ability, but lack of direct patient contact. I am a cytopathologist. I am not okay with that comment. I have no problem sticking needles in people to get a diagnosis for them. I actually rather like seeing patients. We got to stop with the stereotypes. Okay. I I know a lot of people who do blood banking, which is like the single most terrifying, especially in all of pathology to me, because you kill somebody almost instantly. And one little error and somebody dies. It's really scary. Um, So I really, I respect transfusion a ton because to me it is terrifying. And yet, and these are folks who see patients all the time. It's like a whole branch of medicine where you can have a donor room, where you deal with apheresis. You are seeing patients constantly. And yet people, the assumption is we don't see patients. When somebody said this to me several years ago when I was still a staff pathologist, my response was, you see this slide in my hand? I may not be touching this person, but this is my patient and I will treat them as if they were right in front of me. There is a respect that we give to every single patient. And the dude blushed and got kind of embarrassed. And I said, if you're feeling embarrassed, you should. There is so little understood about what it is we do, but it is so critical we got to stop the stereotype. We just have to. So, yes, you can't be what you don't see. If people aren't seeing people who inspire them, and now this is when I became vice president of SBP, and at that point there were only 192 medical schools in the country. There are now more. They're, like, kind of cropping up everywhere. We, we keep opening medical schools, but we're not increasing the number of residency positions to train in this country. That's a thing for a whole different kind of lecture, but it is a problem. And within these faculty, you have 140 black academic pathologists, roughly, because I know several who have left academics since this happened. Um, So that's not even one for every medical school you have in the country. I interviewed somebody who's now, she's now faculty. She was a student, God, almost a decade and a half ago now. One of the, probably one of the best students I've ever interviewed. I mean, this young woman was really amazing. Grades, amazing. Steps, amazing. Like, wanted to be a pathologist coming through the door. And I was the first black pathologist she met on the interview trail. And that was her like 13th interview. And she goes, what's it like? I go, what do you mean? She goes, what's it like being the only one? And I sighed, because I, I hadn't really thought about it. And I looked at her, I looked her dead in the face and said, you know what, it's hard. Because some days it's really hard. We'll get into that. This is something I recently wrote, not to big myself up, but we started looking at diversity, and if there's a whole special issue that I guess edited that's going to come out in Diagnostic Cytopath, um, the paper issue's coming out in a couple of months, but the articles are all, all pretty much already live because I think they're almost all open access. And what we see in cytopathology is what we see in pathology, which, 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 which is what we see in medicine, which is we're not that diverse. I mean, cytopathology has done a really great job of recruiting more women. It's probably the most female dominant subspecialty in pathology, but that's about it. Everything else, we just, we we got work to do. We, We just, we have work to do. But it's really interesting because we have at least seen some shift. Um, I think it's really important to note here that people who are international medical graduates are in many ways diverse and are adding to the diversity that we see in our practice. And we have a lot of international medical grads in pathology and a lot that we can learn from those folks. So this is an, I think this is an opportunity that we can certainly do more. And then there's the pathway. And so a lot of people will call this the pipeline. I try to encourage people not to call it the pipeline because one of the things I've learned is the term pipeline can have negative connotation, particularly for indigenous Americans. So pathway is a little bit better. Pipeline also kind of conveys a almost straight path. And the reality is a lot of us got to pathology not through a straight path. I have a lot of friends who are like OB first, then path, ortho first, then path. They all saw the light, good for them. They got out and got somewhere good. But this is the reality. It's not everybody goes, you know, med school, residency, fellowship, all through pathology. And so we have to be, some people don't even go to medical school right away after college. They're like some of the best people because they, they keep things very real and they're, very, they're a lot of fun to talk to. So 
yes, we're looking from a national organization standpoint, we are looking more at you know, this pathway and how can we get people interested. My favorite thing to do, talk to the kiddies. Five-year-olds think pathology is really cool. And that's when you have to hit them because you know what? Your five-year-old goes to a pediatrician, possibly an orthopedic surgeon, who knows however many other kinds of doctors depending on what conditions that they may or may not have. How many of them go to a pathologist? And therein is our problem. And so we get students who matriculate into medical school 99% of them have no idea what a pathologist does because they've never been exposed to one and we've already lost the battle because they're coming in, I want to be an orthopod, I want to do urology, I want to do ENT. And I'm like, no, you really don't. Let me convince you why. It works sometimes. <laughs> um, Post-sophomore fellowships, this is my next slide, really critical. A lot of them are starting to die, which is terrible. I know several people who have done them and speak nothing but highly of the experience of the post-sophomore fellowship. Like everything else, though, it needs funding. I mean, they don't, they don't really do this for free, and you don't want to charge them tuition at the same time because who wants to be in medical school five years at this rate? It's just expensive. Um, so they are good experiences. I think we need to figure out ways to keep more of them. There have been several papers in the last few years really championing the post-sophomore fellowship as a way to recruit, and it is, because they essentially get to be a PGY-1 for a year. And it's a cool way, and they really make good residents too, because for real, we all know it was like to be a first year resident with no training. It's not pretty. <laughs> I remember very well what my first month of surge path was, and it was my first month of residency. And yeah, I ended up in the ER once with a, with a cut too, so that was, that was awesome, awesome, awesome first year. Um, but I love my fellow residents, and people were really nice to me. This is the last slide before I start embarrassing myself for about 10 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions. Pathology student interest groups are a big deal. At NJMS, we did not have one until a very enterprising first year student who just happened to come up to me after one of my lectures, because I guess I'm somewhat approachable, um, you know, talked about, could we start one? All right, I mean, it's something I'd want to do for a while, but nobody, had, and by then I was also chair, which was very helpful, because then I could control funds too. So, all right, let's do it. This coming year, we have five students going into pathology out of a class of 180. This is not bad when you consider that, well actually when I graduated we were pretty solid. I think there were four of us out of 170. But there were years we've had one, there were years we've had none. And I think it's, as I say when I teach the students, I think this is really important. If you really wanna know what it's like to be a scientist, hang out in the lab for a summer. And I mean the lab like a researcher's lab. If you really wanna know what it's like to be a pathologist, come to the floor, come to a sign out, see the gross room. Go to the clinical lab. It's not a whole bunch of boop, 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 boop of machines. There are people in there doing work. That was a funny face, by the way. There were people in there doing work. There are humans, there are techs, there are pathologists working together. I mean, but if you don't know that, why would you apply? We successfully launched our first acting internship for graduation credit in pathology. And so now we kind of treat them as what it would be like if you were a pathology resident. So, you know, come in, grow some cases, take a little call because you're gonna take it with a resident. I'm not gonna just you know, put a fourth year medical student on call. Like I, I, I like my job. But get the experience of being it so you can see what it's like, the reality, not because I'm a, I teach 24 hours of preclinical lectures still, because I'm crazy. And none of that is for real pathology. It's just not. And so for the students to see it is a big deal. So with all of that background, I'm gonna embarrass myself and I'm okay with embarrassing myself. You know, everyone's got a story. The first part of the story is when I was a lot better looking. Um, and there were, there were three phases of, like, what I call the three phases of Fitzhugh before she became Fitzhugh Cole. She never calls herself, makes her husband mad. The first phase was the high school phase. The high school phase was interesting because I was, I mean, you can't tell looking at me now, but I was like a big time jock. Like I was, I was sports. I played field hockey in the fall. I played, I fenced in the winters. That was great. Cause I started out in varsity basketball my freshman year. And then I decided to quit cause I didn't love it anymore. My father, may he rest in peace, almost had a stroke. He's like, you're a freshman playing varsity basketball. You are throwing away money. We have to send your brother to college. I'm like, well, what about me? And so, that guy, he got really, I mean, my dad got really upset. A friend of mine bet me 20 bucks, solid $20 bet, that I would not be better than her at fencing. I said, a word? 
when you're a natural athlete, you can pretty much outcompete the average human in sports. Um, we'll get we'll get to where that went in a minute. And then of course after Rutgers, which I I loved undergrad, I go back in a heartbeat. I went to medical school. We'll get there too. But I was a for real fencer. NCAA Division One, four seasons at Rutgers. I was captain for two of them. This person here, the one on the right, that's actually me. I'm like two of her now. But back then, I could move with the best of them. It was fun, but it is expensive. And so I am thankful to groups like the Peter Westbrook Foundation that actually fund underrepresented fencers to learn. And the Westbrook Foundation, particularly Peter Westbrook, was one of the first black men to go to the Olympics. He's a, he was an Olympic saber fencer. Big deal. And he paid it, he paid it forward. And he's been coaching kids ever since. And a lot of his students have made it to the Olympics. I clearly did not make it to the Olympics. Um, but I got to NCAA, so there was something worth that. I don't think I would have gotten anywhere that I got without these two lovely people here. These are my parents. Um, they both passed Oh, see, now, oh, this is the part I, I had trouble getting through. They both passed away. My mom actually passed away when I was a second-year student. I was 23 years old, so in a few short months, because it'll be 23 years in October since she died, in a few short months, I will have lived longer without my mother than I lived with her. And that is very difficult. But as I was telling um, the residents this morning, my mother saved my life. She died of colon cancer when she was 49 years old. She was diagnosed at 48 and only made it 18 months from diagnosis to her passing away. And had she not been diagnosed, I would not have gotten my first colonoscopy at 39, where they discovered, amongst other things, a 2.3 centimeter tubular villus adenoma in my descending colon. Had she not passed away, I would more likely than not be a colon cancer patient. And so I tell that story every year during Colon Cancer Awareness Month to hopefully encourage other people to get their colonoscopies. It's the best nap that I get every year. Propofol is a great drug. It is literally the best nap that I get every year, okay? But it's worth it. You know, and she was very, she was really, really proud of me. And I, I do miss, she was the one, because my dad, my poor dad worked two jobs for much of my existence um, to make ends meet for our family. They were, just, you can tell, super supportive. I got her good looks, so I'm very grateful for that. Those cheekbones are killer. The dude on the right is my twin brother. Yes, I have a twin. I, I don't like sharing my coolness with him. He was actually the cool kid in high school. He used to travel with literally a gaggle of girls behind him, which I could not understand. Like, literally, they wanted to carry his stuff. They thought he was handsome. I don't see it, but whatever, he's my brother. This was a, he was not, he hated school. He's like, my, my daughter actually also hates school. Hated school. He is now a superintendent of a rather large school district in New Jersey. Why? Because eventually you get it together, and he did. The lovely lady on my left, well, it's my left looking at the picture, but could be, I mean, I try not to look at it like it's radiology, is my older sister. She's amazing. She was a teacher for 30 years, and so even though she's only 51, yeah, I put her age on blast, she'll never watch this, um, is recently retired, because you can do that when you're a tenured teacher, and she is living her best life, and I am a little jealous, because I won't be retiring at 50 anything. They have also been super supportive of me and my crazy, including the tears that I can shed as a chair that I can't shed at work. This lovely, handsome thing is my husband. This is the guy who's at the baseball game right now, and I know he's mad because he is not a sports person at all. But he loves his children and he loves his wife, so he's at the baseball game while I'm in Seattle talking to all of you. And I appreciate them. We started dating 20 years ago, and we got married in 2011. And when I tell you this man has been my rock through all of this nonsense, he really, really has. And regardless of what I always say, you know, if, if you get into a relationship, like find you a boo like Alexis Ohio, so they cheer as loud for you as he does for Serena Williams when she plays tennis. Back in those days, well, I say, yo, get you a boo like my husband Rivo, because he really is my biggest cheerleader and I will love him forever for it. And we've had experiences. You know, I kind of warned him when we first started dating. I was like, you know, it's gonna, you're gonna hear some things dating a black woman. If you decide to marry me, you're gonna hear a whole lot of things. And I mean, I've been called the N-word while by people outside our car while we were in our car together. Um, and he actually almost jumped out of the car. And I'm like, please, let's not do that because you'll go to prison. Um, we've been through a lot. And he is still here 20 years later. So there, there's also then I do get lectured occasionally. Well, why black woman did you marry this white, white man? Because you're a powerful black woman and now look what you're perpetuating. 
I'm like, I'm perpetuating the fact that he loves me. That's it. I, I really don't care. Your opinion does not live in my house. And so that's how I look at things. That, that's, and that's important to me. This marriage produced these two beautiful humans. I went back and forth about whether or not I was going to keep them in the lecture. So the little dude is playing baseball right now. He needed a haircut in this picture and needs one now. And then my daughter got, she got my whole face and the cheekbones, so I miss them. But when you feel like your life at work is terrible and you got a couple of these, suddenly it's not so terrible because all the bad stuff really goes away. Um, I will be going to shop for a present right after this so that I don't get like massacred when I get home. So how this all started, I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. I do not make it a secret. I knew nothing about pathology like most other students. When I started medical school, I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. And I spent half my fourth year of medical school breaking rat legs and putting rock, rods in them and giving them Celebrex to see whether or not it, it affected fracture healing. That was all for naught because I did not match in orthopedics, clearly. But I had rotated through pathology. And one of the things that I was inspired by when I was on one of my ortho rotations, so we got to go back to pathology, which I thought was cool. I should have known then. Like, you know, sometimes you, just, you get the signals, but you don't listen. I should have known. And I went back to, I went back with a frozen section. The surgeons were there. And the pathologist, who actually eventually became my mentor and how I ended up in bone and soft tissue, partly because I, want, I, was, I wanted to do ortho, but partly because she was just amazing, is basically telling these surgeons what to do and everything. You know, her frozen read determined the next steps for the case. And I'm like... You get to tell surgeons what to do. This is, this is, and they have to listen to you. Ooh. <laughs> I was, I thought it was exciting. So when the ortho thing didn't work out, and I mean, it was a spectacular fail of the most epic kind. Um, and I mean, ortho wasn't incredibly diverse either. It was, all my interviews were pretty much me and a lot of Caucasian men, because that's ortho. That was, that was what it was. And I'm sitting here thinking, and I would, it was all the same dudes over and over and over again. So we're all chatting, like every single interview, because we're all interviewing at the same places. And I started to think, I don't know if this is going to work out. And then, and I'm, it, for those of you, if you didn't match, I mean, if you matched and you don't have this experience, I'm very happy for you, because it, it, it was one of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with, was opening, the, opening that email that said, you know, dear, dear Miss, because then it's Miss Fitzhugh, I wasn't a doctor yet, dear Miss Fitzhugh, we regret to inform you, and that was it. I never read the rest of the email, I knew. So while my classmates were all jumping up and down, oh, we match, ah! And I just went outside in front of the ambulance bay, and I started to cry, and my ER attending found me as I was crying, and she just let me cry on her shoulder. Because it hurt. I'm like, what is wrong with me? I had the scores. I had the grades. I, I, it should have been a shoe-in. was not a shoe-in. But I became a pathologist. And so I went to Albany for a year, came back to Jersey to finish up, which was great, because I really honed those bone and soft tissue skills, which is one of the reasons I got hired. Went to fellowship at Mount Sinai for a little bit. That was good times. I met Magic Johnson because his, Sodexo, which is his food company, took over the cafeteria services at Sinai. And so I, I don't have the picture in here, but I got a picture like with Magic Johnson's head like right next to mine. I like, had to bend over because he's like eight feet tall, right next to my head. I was like, ooh, this is cool. I, had, I snuck out of an Ebus to get that picture, don't tell anybody. And then I got my job, right? And you would think, you know, in your job and in your residency, you won't go through this kind of stuff. And I will tell you a short story I'm debating whether or not I should do the microaggression slide because we're running out of time. Maybe I won't. I'll just tell you what it's about. But this story, I was signing out with one of my, one of my attendings who became a colleague of mine for several years. And, you know, this is our first, I was a third year resident. This is our first sign out together. And he says to me, so what was your GPA when you graduated from college? And I'm sitting here like, I'm a third year medical student. Who cares? Because like nobody's asking that anymore. Like, it doesn't matter. I was like, I had a 3.5. And I'm thinking to myself, and I barely studied because I was an athlete. That was more fun. But I had a 3.5. He goes, oh, cool. So did I. And I'm like, OK. He goes through a couple more slides. And so how long did it take you to graduate from medical school? And I'm like, four years. I didn't do an extra degree. You know, if you get an MPH, it might be five. You do a PhD, it might be seven or eight. Four, four years. I'm straight MD, four years. He goes, oh, that's good, because most of the black kids in my class can graduate in less than five. To my face, in sign out. And I was just like, there is very little in this world that renders me speechless. Speech, like, because what are you going to say? And I was like, okay, this is the single most awkward moment I've now had in my entire training. It was, because what are you going to say? What are you going to do? 
And so with that, you know, we I have this. I'm not. It's actually a really good thing if you've ever seen the microaggressions um, video on YouTube. But I'm going to talk you through it because we're running out of time. It's essentially it like it likens microaggressions to mosquito bites. As I say, for some people, if you experience microaggressions, but it's a mosquito bite every now and again, it's itchy, but it's not so bad. But imagine if you're experiencing them all the time. People are constantly saying, oh, you're so well-spoken, or, oh, you know, you should consider an easier major in college. I don't know if this is for you, or there's, there's a really interesting one where it's like, it's a, it's like a, a, pretty much like a football bro, and he's like, oh, the Redskins, should keep our name, we're the Redskins, and you see an indigenous person just like, oh. You know, the, and the thing is, you experience these kinds of things all the time. My absolute favorite, I'm going to go past this. Good. My absolute favorite is, can I touch your hair? So when I straighten, I used to straighten my hair for years. When I got pregnant with my daughter, you can see how curly their heads were. I decided to myself that I was going to let my hair go natural because why the heck not? And so eventually, once I grew it out enough, because I can't do short, short hair because I just, my eye, it stresses me out. So once it grew out enough, I finally cut it. And incessantly for the next month. Can I touch your hair? Can I touch your hair? It looks so soft. Can I touch your hair? I'm like, have I ever asked you if I could touch your hair? No, you can't touch my hair. I'm not a puppy. You can't pet me. But this is something that as women of color we go through and it's really any textured hair. You don't have to be a black woman, but if you have like slightly curly hair, it looks like it's got some texture. Everybody wants to touch it. No, we're not puppies. No, you're not going to touch my hair. Being called token was really, was really kind of terrible and also happened at work because I wanted to join a committee in an organization and they were trying to diversify because there weren't many voices of color on any of the committees in the organization. And the person says to me straight up, she goes, well, they're looking for a lot of black people. You can be their token. To my face, just, just like that. I'm just like, what about, I earned that though. What about that? So that's the thing. Am I an affirmative action hire? That's one of my favorites. Or you know, you're, you're a chair because they needed a black chair. That's another one of my favorites. Uh, you get these jobs because you earn them. Nobody's going to make you a chair if they don't think you can do the job. They're not going to put an entire department of a medical school at risk to prove a point. I mean, but, but people have said it. Another of my favorites is I was going down to do an autopsy. I do still rarely do them. And I was wearing scrubs and I was handed garbage by a patient's family because she assumed I was house staff and housekeeping. And here, can you throw this out for me? I can't find a garbage can. In scrubs, the, the housekeepers don't wear scrubs, but okay. So this, I mean, thing is, after it just keeps happening all the time. It's exhausting. But this is very real life for some of your colleagues. So I just, I want to put that out there. I was not granted a leadership position in my department for a long time. And this is where I shout out my former chair because he gave me the opportunity to be the medical director at one of our affiliate labs. And it made all the difference in the world. It gave me the opportunity, where so I can go to the next slide, to really make my name in the health system because the health system had a huge role in who got hired as the academic chair because the health system and the academic part of our enterprise are very intimately linked. And so they wanted somebody who understood the system and understood, um, you know, understood the variables there. When my former chair asked me if he could put my name on the list to be interim, and I still don't know who all was on the list, I laughed in his face hard. Because I'm like, they are not going to pick me. I am 41 years old. I am a woman. I am black. This will cause drama. He's like, but you can do the job, and I know you can do it. Knock yourself out. Put me on. But here I stand four years later as a permanent chair. So he saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself and was really ready not to give myself the opportunity. Yes, I became interim chair during COVID. This is something I'm sure Jeff also understands very well. And boy, did we new interims through COVID go through it, but we made it, you know, we survived it. But that was kind of the test that put me on the path where I am today. So thankfully, I, we don't have time for questions and I'm gonna apologize unless your faculty meeting starts late. But so what does the future hold? And the answer is, I don't know. I wish I had an answer. I don't know. What I would love to see is that I am not the last of the unicorns. Like, I feel like I shouldn't be the third of anything in pathology. It's 2024. Like, why is it all taking so long? I, I shouldn't be so unusual that we talk about it. Like, there should be more of me. And part of the reason why I want to do so well in this job is so that when the next Valerie Fitzhugh comes up at some point, she'll believe she can do it. And I know that's a heavy weight to carry, but it, to me, it's worth the carry. 
we, we are a beautiful people. We are a beautiful specialty and we do a lot. We, we do a whole heck of a lot. We have work and we have growth, but I think we can do the work and the growth together. And I think the fact that there's interest in this topic really does speak to how we can do this the right way and how we can embrace everybody for just who they are and to not be any different. So those are my closing remarks. I threw one in because my daughter insisted. She insisted that I throw this in. Um, so she was actually texting me during this entire thing and I just had to ignore her for the last hour. So get your CME if you're gonna get it. And I'm done speaking words, so that's that. I thank you for your attention. CME if you're eligible. You sat here for an hour, you earned it. We do have, I mean, we are going to be late for faculty meeting, but I think that's okay. Um, we do have a few online questions. Sure. Um, one is um, a comment, but I think it lends itself to a question. So the comment is without improving the visibility of pathology for medical students, nothing else is unlikely to, to, to work. And so I guess the question is, how do we do that? So agree 100%. We need to market ourselves better. And this, and I actually talked about this a little bit with the residents as well. We, both as pathologists and as scientists, are not getting ourselves out there enough. And I think this is where social media really can become useful. Because I, we have seen medical students get more exposure to pathologists probably on social media than anything else that we've done in the last 20 years. And what the students come to find out is, we're pretty chill and like we like to teach, but we also, for the majority of us, are very happy with our career choice. And that's what students need to know is, you can be very happy doing this job and you can have a quality of life that is phenomenal, but we have to put ourselves out there. Like, I'm not afraid to tell my story. I'm certainly not afraid to put myself out there so that students see that it is a great specialty. And oh, by the way, we're just like everybody else. Yeah, we have our introverts and our extroverts. We have people with zero special personality, but guess what? So does every other specialty in medicine. And they're the ones who see the patients every day, so you can only imagine if they end with no personality. So, you know, it's not, it, it's not that we're not there, but we need to put ourselves out there. We can't be afraid to do it. Now, not every pathologist is gonna put themselves out there, but it doesn't have to be all of us. Just enough of us to make sure that people realize how awesome the specialty is, because they're pretty darn awesome. Dr. Sweetwine. <laughs> so looking at um, some of the distributions that you're putting up of who the physicians are, how do you, or how, how do those data, and you may not know this, but how do those data um, sort of relate to basically like the influx of students coming in and increasing versus people leaving? Right, because then if you see a decrease in women as you're going up in age, sure that could be because it's a different generation of physicians, but it also can be people leaving. And I and I don't know the exact answer to that this is double AMC data. It's probably a combination of both, because I know some pretty young folks who have left medicine in the not too distant past. Some of it was COVID. Like some people were just like, you know what, I'm good. I'm going to go do something else. Um, and we did see a lot of retirements, but that was because. You know, with the first wave of COVID in particular, we didn't know how this was going to affect older people. And they felt they were at risk. And they're like, you know what? I don't need to come into the hospital at 75 every day and chance getting killed by this virus. So we, we saw some of that as well. It's getting harder to get people to stay. The practice of medicine, and this is across the board now, not just pathology, has not been kind to people. And I, listen, I remember listening to some of my older colleagues and my teachers Talk about like the good old days, like in the 80s, where they were just raking it in. And then insurance companies really like clamped down on everything and they started to see those changes. I always tell people if you want to make money, if you're in it for money, you need to do something else. You're not going to start making money in medicine until you pay off your loans, which most of us, most of us have, because you're not making anything. And remember, for those of us who are the traditional students, so we've lost our entire 20s to this. Right, so you're already now out into your 30s at minimum before you can start having a life. So I think it's just not as appealing as it used to be either. Doctors work hard, 
you know, I mean, yes, there are work hour limits now, and they didn't exist in the 80s, and I get that, but doctors work really hard. And a lot of people don't want to put in that kind of work anymore. And look, it's the same thing with scientists. I can remember weekends where I would go in like a late, an overnight call, and I'd walk through the medical school to get to the hospital, and there'd be like a lab door open, and you see like some poor postdoc like doing an experiment. It's like two in the morning, and I'm like, and I thought I had it bad. So it's really hard to convince people they want to do this when they start to find out the reality of it. But I think it's something you just, it's like anything else, you got to love it. I love what I do. I'm very fortunate to have the experiences that I've had. But I think we're going to continue to lose people if we don't somehow make it more palatable. Because right now it's not very palatable. And you get, and you're like broke while you do it. So if you were already broke, I mean, if you think about people who are underrepresented, and this is a lot of the reason why when I talk to students, I don't talk to them about just medicine. I also talk to, things, I talk to them about things like PA. Me particularly, I say pathologist assistant because you know, you know, I don't care about the rest of the PAs. But pathologist assistants is a really good choice because you can make a six-figure figure salary in a fraction of the time it takes to go to medical school. Medical technologists can make a great living in a fraction. Cytologists, like you know, the people who screen the slides before I get them, you can make a really nice living and it doesn't have to be be a physician. And for people who are helping, you know, if you're in a family where you know your family's underserved, you have parents working multiple jobs, you have several generations living in a home and you want to contribute to that home, then some of the health professions options are a better option than going to medical school because you earn more quickly and then you earn a lot over the course of your life because you start earning more and more quickly. So I do, I, I do discuss those other options with students. I think it's fair for them to hear it. Thank you.